presentation. They're a group in his address book. So he, he clicks on them in his address book, is presented with some options. One of them is set up a conference call. It goes out and it checks the presence of all, all the group members, finds them on their cell phone, in their office, wherever they are, makes that conference happen. And, and they, uh, they discuss the presentation. Uh, they're having some good discussions, some good facts are being uh, brought out. And so he drags a network recorder onto that, just to you know, drag and drop onto there. Now it's recording the session. It'll package it for him later. Um, as he arrives at his destination in New York, um, he closes down that uh, uh, virtual multimedia terminal application, but he wants to continue the conference call, so he drags his end of it onto his cell phone, closes everything else down. The conference still goes on. He's walking uh, to, uh, to headquarters. Um, as the conference uh, wraps up, it closes. The network understands he's no longer logged onto his terminal, so it sends him an SMS with the URL to the recorded session and also to the, to the finished presentation. Um, he, has, he subscribes. One of the alerts he subscribed to when he woke up was uh, a lo family lo locator. Um, he gets an alert that his son is in the vicinity of a local surfing beach rather than uh, at the vicinity of his school. So he texts him with a keyboard busted, and he's going to deal with that later. Um, goes in uh, into headquarters. RFID authenticates him, of course. He goes over to the active message board. His cell phone uh, indicates uh, to the active message board that his location is standing right in front of there. So he's presented with not the list of meetings for the day, but his meeting, what the, you know, what the location is. And he's offered the ability to beam it to his cell phone, the details, and also the map of the building so they can find his way, which he does. Also, the, the board in the, in the conference room is updated because his location is now in the building, so they know he has arrived. Some non-believers here so far? How does he lose power in the battery? Uh, all, right, well, it's, all right, we can add that. We can work that one in. Um, he's, he's, pre he's giving his presentation. He wants to recall those facts uh, from the conference call. So he pulls up, the, remembers he recorded it, um, but he can't exactly listen to a recording in the, uh, 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 in the meeting. So one of the options when he clicks on that URL is to get a text-to-speech version, which he does. He scans it, uh, uh, extracts the relevant facts, and is able to use them during the meeting. And we're, al we're almost done here. Um, on the way home, chance encounter with a, with a colleague. At, is there a question? How long did that text to speech take? So he's in his meeting now, so he's on his laptop. Uh, so, he, so, he, so he clicked on the URL there. Uh, it was done in the background and pre prepared for him by the network recorder application, not on the fly. It might have been, been a little delay that way. Um, runs into a colleague, wants to share some recent uh, vacation photos. He's in the train station. He has his mobile device, his smartphone. The photos and videos are on his home computer, and uh, not to worry, they're backed up in the network. It's all, it's all uh, integrated, and so he's able to, to pull up some video and photos and share them. Uh, on the way home, uh, after receiving his alert, it's time to board. Um, he resumes watching his game again. He, want, he wants to finish out, see how it turns out. He's been avoiding the news. Um, sets his presence, which is already mobile because of his location. Uh, he sets it to do not disturb. He really wants to relax. His family wants to, to check on him. They see from the, from the home uh, kitchen hub device that he, he's mobile and do not disturb. So they decide not to call him. Uh, but they go to the, uh, um, uh, the, the uh, location tracker and think of it as a family circus. Have you ever seen a family circus cartoon? And they see dad's um, you know, lines where he's been to the train station, to headquarters, back to the train station, riding back to Philadelphia. They can see all that. He's on the train. They know he's fine. They know he's on the way home. Uh, of course, you want to manage who has access to that information. So consent is an important aspect here. Um, but he, he knows his kids get a kick out of it. So he, he puts up with the fact that he, he can't stop at his favorite watering hole on the way home um, because his wife will obviously be able to see that. Um, find, home at last, um, presence is set back to home. He's back to that state where business calls are rooted to the office unless it's a VIP uh, on his VIP list. Um, and he finally walks in the door, and um, uh, this is the really unbelievable part. His family welcomes him home, says, why don't you go in the living room and relax for a while? We won't burden you with our day for right now until dinner. Um, That'll never finish happen. watching the game. It's in the bottom of the ninth inning. As he walks in the living room, he's presented with, hey, you're, you're by a better screen to view this. Would you like to switch over? Sure. The, the cell phone becomes the remote, and he finishes watching the ninth inning. All right. So thanks for bearing with me through that. I love telling that one. And um, that would be cool, I guess, right? Number one, would, would you find some useful stuff in there? And um, number two, would you agree that that couldn't be done with a few downloaded apps? Right? Probably not, right? It's a lot of integration, a lot of network-based capabilities across devices, across applications being used there. So that's the context and, and a long way of making the point um, of what I want to go to now. 
what, is the, what does the network operator have that, in, that can enable all that? And it's really the network operator advantage. Um, well, the first two things I lumped together is ubiquitous broadband. For Verizon, you know, that's Fios, fiber to the home. It's 3G network on e based on EVDO evolving to 4G based on LTE. Ubiquitous broadband, and everything else rides on that, and, and we, all, we all kind of depend on that. It's communications. There's a lot of communications going on there, unified-type communications. We have a long history there. It's content. We have a shorter history here, but, of course, there's a, uh, massive libraries of content build up, both um, from a TV viewing experience on the broadband portal, on the wireless device, and um, uh, you, more and more user-generated content in the network, like those pictures and photos. Uh, and finally, devices. Um, not only the, the phone and not only the additional types of cell phones, set-top boxes, home routers, the, the fridge, which is LTE-enabled, a lot more non-traditional devices are there. But really, the keys to unlocking this potential, number one, there's two of them, in my view. Number one is convergence. Uh, I actually talked about that last time uh, at the February version of this conference uh, for Verizon that's based on IMS. So I'm going to skip over that one, and the focus here today is open development. And so what were the, some of the building blocks for that scenario? And a lot of, loca of network-based things here. Location and messaging, obviously, key. Calendar. Uh, presence was uh, alerting. Uh, session shifting across devices. Um, that network recorder. Consent is very important. I showed network PVR. So I think these are a lot of the network value, the unique value that has to come out of the network in order to enable uh, those kind of applications, in addition to the intelligence running on the devices, in addition to the downloaded apps. So finally, what's Verizon doing about it? Um, well, as was mentioned a little earlier, about a month ago, we launched a Verizon developer community, kind of taking to the next level activities that were already underway. And it's really um, uh, the part I want to focus on there, and uh, this is my last slide, is the uh, network APIs piece of that. And that was mentioned earlier, I think, by Lillian. So what are we doing to expose all of those kinds of enablers that can be used to create applications, rich user experiences, the kind we're really going for and the kind I, I showed an example of? Well, there's something called a we call a service execution gateway. It sits in the network and southbound from it are location and are network enablers, things like location, messaging, and all of those other things to start. It normalizes the APIs up to application developer community, also provides security, also provides usage accounting, kind of what's going on. We create and make available a software development kit that allows uh, developers to uh, develop to and test with the uh, network APIs. And we're opening uh, innovation centers where you can come hands-on. One in Waltham, Massachusetts, focused on LTE device in innovation. Uh, one in the, in the Bay Area, um, uh, under development, focusing on application innovation. To wrap up, I'm sorry, I lied. That was my second last slide. Um, really about convergence. For us, that's based on IMS, which is our services convergence strategy. And to complete the puzzle, open development, and really deriving all of the potential from those network APIs, those network enablers that can take this whole thing, we believe, to a next level of value in the subscriber experience. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, everybody. We'll start with some questions, and I want to open it up to the audience for more questions. Um, Brenda started to talk about the user experience mostly controlled by the handset, talked about the iPhone and the users wanting to touch the screen, and that was, you know, certainly over six million devices sold in just, a few, just in about a year or, or so. Uh, so certainly a great user experience. Bill talked about a completely different side of the equation where the network is providing the user experience, a lot of the capabilities in the network. So who is controlling the user experience? Depends on the time frame you're talking about. Today, it's really controlled by the device manufacturer. But the, where, and where users wanted to go, right, was the top level on my first slide. They want any service, anywhere, any device. Well, they're not going to get that if the device manufacturer is controlling the experience. They only get it if they have the type of experience that Bill articulated in his nice slide uh, walk through that kind of experience the operator is absolutely in the heart of so it's a matter of time today or tomorrow let's talk about today you have a great so. iPhone has all these apps but it has very spotty coverage for making regular phone calls 
Is that a good user experience? Obviously, lots of people have bought it. <laughs> so, I do want to say that uh, the experience is an end-to-end -end context, correct? The device does not control the end-to-end -end context. It may control the user personalization aspects, maybe, like I said, the neighborhood information, collaborate with the network on power management and things like that. Um, but the user, the device absolutely has no clue how this packet is coming, where is the content provider, is it cached, uh, is the policy applied by the network provider, etc. And that's the reason I think both Vince and I said that the operator has this gold mine in their hands, like the subscriber information, their family information, ZIP plus four, of course, the, the respecting privacy and rules and regulations. They can truly personalize the experience for the user based on all their location, their billing plans, their preferences. So I would say the uh, network operator is the one that controls the experience. The preferences, of course, the consumer controls, which app they want to run. I think we're in violent agreement that the operator needs to be the one controlling the experience, right? I don't think that's the part of contention. I'm just uh, being, um, what do you say, let's take the devil's advocate. Today, users pick their devices based on the experience they perceive from that device. And they take for granted what's offered by and, and the fact that there's all kind of uh, cool and exciting uh, technological stuff going on underneath the hood, most users can't even you know, understand it because they don't have the background for it. Yeah, I think I, 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 I'm, of course, sensitive to using the word controlling the user experience, but from the operator, maybe more enabling and managing uh, the user experience where appropriate. And I think um, to your second question, uh, um, and notice I'm the only speaker. I didn't mention the iPhone in my presentation. But the, the, um, <laughs> you know, the, the, the device, the rich, <laughs> capable device, not taking any, anything away from the iPhone, is is wonderful, but it's it's half the story, right? And and I, I, I attempted to show through through a story all the stuff you can't do with just the device. So you know you got the network. The network can bring the other half of things. It can be the cross device, the cross platform stuff, and it can be the network enhanced with presence and location and and all those kinds of things that are in the network to kind of complete what's possible. And we saw you know how successful just one device can be if it's done well. And I think we, we can go orders of magnitude beyond that adding into it, not not instead of, but adding into it um, what the network can do. Given that the device is so important, given the fact that I haven't seen too many LTE devices at Best Buy or any other place, do you think there's a case that might occur where LTE has an I in it called light and maybe HSPA plus becomes LTE or HRPD solution becomes LTE and you have this incremental step for, let's say, the next five years? Uh, well, no, I mean, our, our plans are, are kind of well publicized and, and we're, we're uh, much sooner than, uh, than five years. In fact, the first LTE call was just uh, covered in the press, I don't know, a week or so ago. So um, we're, we're very aggressively deploying. I don't, there's, there's not a delay or anything like that that we see if that's what you're getting at. But like in yeah. AT&T's case, I think they're doing the HSP Plus and availability and intelligence case, same thing, et cetera. So I'm just wondering, are you the exception? And I don't know, maybe somebody else can speak to the... Uh, well, you know, I don't want to speak, you know, around specific um, uh, operator deployment plans, but I can tell you that in general, um, you know, Verizon is the most aggressive, and everyone else uh, will be following within the next uh, year or two. So I think within, you know, uh, 2011, 2012 timeframe is when you'll start to see really large-scale deployments of, uh, of LTE. But, but uh, Akshay, I do want to say that... Uh, the underpinning expectations of the network, the ecosystem, and the applications are already there in the 3G and 3G+. Plus. So people are not just waiting for LTE, right, because HSPA is delivering high speed. People are getting a taste of this collaborative applications and integrated applications. It's already laying the foundation for the already significantly increased expectation around LTE. But the build-out is... Most of them are intelligently building it to be ready for LTE. I, I want to make one other comment to the earlier question. Uh, the perception versus control was what I was saying. What I'm finding is when something doesn't work, people don't blame the device. They blame the network. 
when everything works, they do praise the device. That's just the way the users perceive things. Yeah. Yes, you got it. My question goes to the Google Chrome and the Apple Watch. Yeah. Um, I Yeah, so I think uh, I mean that that is the reality where where we're going. I mean, if you look if you look at like Verizon steps over the last couple of years, Open Development Initiative, uh, LTE Innovation Center, these are all um, you know places where third parties can come in, uh, use the enablers of the network, but build their own stuff. So it's not linked into our app store or even our services. It's opening the network for devices uh, first, and then we're we're doing the same thing. You know, kind of a year following with applications open the network APIs, and it, it's, not, it, it's not linked only to our services or our app store. Uh, those are very open. I'm not, sure I, I, I'm not sure I agree, at least from a Verizon perspective. First of all, the Femto cells are available, and, and other third-party devices are, 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 are available that have been developed. And then we're, we're just not, not as far along on the application side, but the, the direction, it, it's kind of been, I think it's demonstrated on, on the devices that it is open, and, and, and we're uh, um, following that same path on the applications. Um, where I think you will you will see that as we kind of I mean it isn't launched yet it was announced uh, uh, about a month ago and we're looking towards the end of the year for an initial launch so we you know we've, we've got a, we've got some steps to cover but that certainly is the direction. I think we have to move on and um, just so that we have to finish because we have one more question so we have to be but yeah. The question was, can you have multiple app stores at the same time, and does that confuse people? Does that help? What do you think? And I think the direction of the question was towards Bill. <laughs> Um, although I don't have to be the one answering, but I, I, I don't think I have a good answer for that. I think, you know, that's a recognized, and that came up in the last panel. Um, you know, that's kind of the, I think the market will, will dictate what happens there, and, um, you know, and we'll, we'll respond. I mean, the, the, we're not, it's not a, you know, from Verizon's perspective, it's not a Verizon app store only. Um, there are partner app stores um, that, that will also support, so it's not, there's no attempt to be kind of a complete walled garden there. And um, with, the, with the Jill initiative um, that wasn't mentioned yet, there's a kind of a cross-carrier and, and a way to get into, uh, you know, applications right once and run on multiple carriers. So there's some steps, you know, kind of in that direction to, to make it simpler from the, uh, uh, from the developer perspective. But I think there's a lot more to go there. And I don't know the answer from the App Store. That, you know, I see, that, I see that challenge, and I don't know where that's going to end up in five years. So just one quick comment on that. Um, uh, I do predict that the longer-term destination is a truly open 
world with open APIs, combination of client-side APIs and network-side APIs. That's the holy grail, right? And the consumers have tremendous power. The big customers have tremendous power. I think in the long run, in my humble opinion, that will happen. But in the short run, you will actually see the jockeying for competitive advantage through these app stores. And then the next uh, natural evolution may be a collaboration between app stores, where there may be partnerships, there's mutual benefits, and mutual value. At the end of the day, uh, the value needs to be created, right, for these things to flourish. If the, if the value is not created for the people investing, like, like the providers, they invest billions of dollars, uh, then the, the velocity of uh, convergence towards the uh, open API system will be slower. But if there is value created and the collaborations and partnerships are right, it will accelerate. Just my two cents. 